So our next speaker from uh, Colorado State University is Professor Louis Schaaf, his honor. Uh, Professor Schaaf is a life fellow of ICCLE. He won numerous uh, awards, including the ICCLE Third Millennium Medal, the Second, the Second to Achievement Award, and we are very happy and honored to have him today. Okay, so uh, I want to talk about coherence in its many guises, and so what I'm trying to do is make a lot of things look like the same thing and argue that this idea of coherence actually brings some intuition and insight into a lot of the things we do in statistical signal processing. And I start out here with this comment that uh, the dictionary definition of coherence is that it's an orderly or logical relation of parts. You might call it an organizing principle that affords comp comprehension. So I'm going to try and give kind of a breezy survey of where three generations of work in statistical signal processing has actually discovered and exploited technical concepts of coherence that actually merit the non-technical definition, which, which is to say that these uh, technical concepts of coherence that we have actually afford some comprehension of what we do in statistical signal processing. Now you'll see I'm really forcing this idea of coherence as I go through here. Uh, I hope you don't find it too forced. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to lay down some definitions of Hadamard, Hilbert, and Euclidean coherence definitions. And then I'm going to visit some topics of st in statistical signal processing which I've called generation one topics, generation two topics, and generation three topics and try and argue that these are actually topics in coherence. And that, that's my mission here. Okay, so I'm going to jump right in and what I'm going to do is suggest that maybe there's an organizing principle for talking about coherence. And what I'm going to suggest is that I'm going to build a large matrix. This is a large Hermitian matrix. And it consists of puzzle pieces. And all these puzzle, all these puzzle pieces fit together. Which is to say, if that's an N1 by N1 matrix, and that's an N2 by N2 matrix, then that's N1 by N2, that's N2 by N1. So you can think about these things as square matrices of various sizes, and these as being rectangular matrices. And when I do a space-time problem late in the talk, you'll see that this kind of a matrix arises naturally. All right, so these puzzle pieces all fit together. Now, here's our organizing principle for coherence, and that is we're going to say that each of the ideas of coherence that we will encounter and use in this talk may be written as Hadamard coherence. And I wish I'd called this coherence R, but I called it cosine squared R. But I did change my title to coherence because I figured nobody would come to a talk on cosine squared and all of its guises. So I changed it to coherence. Okay. It's one minus the determinant of R divided by the product of these determinants. And the first thing I'm going to do is convince you that this produces things that, you're, that you normally see when we do our statistical signal processing. That will be our definition as we go through the talk. So for example, suppose we build a structured covariance matrix which is a Gramian, which is to say the northwest block is an inner product UHU, the southeast block is an inner product VHV, and then these off-diagonal blocks are UHV, VHU. So this is a Gramian. And U and V here are respectively N by Q and N by P matrices. And if you push through this definition that I gave, you get a formula here that says that coherence is 1 minus the determinant of UH, I minus PV, U over determinant UHU, and PV is the projection onto the subspace spanned by the columns of V. And this is actually our usual definition of cosine squared of the angle between two multidimensional subspaces. And it's a, bulk, it's a bulk definition of coherence. In other words, it's one non-negative number. But in fact, we can resolve it into one minus a product of one minus rho i squares. And in this decomposition, these rho i squares are cosine squares of the principal angles between the subspaces. 
So if you want to take bulk coherence between two linear spaces, you can do that. You get it from Hadamard coherence. But if you want to resolve it into its constituent parts, so to speak, then you need to resolve it into these principal angles between subspaces. And we know what these are. These come out of a singular value decomposition. OK, so far, so good. And if we take the special case where this subspace U, this multidimensional subspace U, is one-dimensional, so it's a one-dimensional subspace, then that previous formula just reduces to 1 minus this thing, and it reduces to UH PVU over UHU, and we have a picture. So here's a one-dimensional subspace. Here's a multidimensional subspace of n-dimensional Euclidean space. And we can see that what we've got is sim this cosine squared is simply the ratio of this distance to that distance. So we get out of this definition, we get our familiar definition of what uh, the cosine squared of the angle is between a one-dimensional subspace and a multidimensional subspace. And if both subspaces are one-dimensional, then this line is the one-dimensional V. And we just get UHV squared over UHU VHV. And that's, that's our comfortable definition of the cosine squared of the angle between two one-dimensional subspaces. But you can see that it came out of a much more general idea. OK, now, how about Hilbert coherence? So now, now what we're going to do is we're going to define random vectors U1 through UQ and V1 through VP. So now we can think about subspaces spanned by random variables. So you have to think about these random variables as vectors. And we're talking about a linear space spanned by these Q random variables and a linear space spanned by those P random variables. And we're going to build out their composite covariance matrix. So RUU is simply the covariance matrix for this U vector. RVV is the covariance matrix for this V vector. RUV is a cross-covariance matrix. RVU is a cross-covariance matrix. All right, now, if we plug this matrix into our definition of Hadamard coherence, we get 1 minus the determinant of RUU minus RUV, RVV inverse RVU, divided by the determinant of RUU. And of course, this is just, that's simply the volume of the A, of the a priori concentration ellipse for U and this is the volume of the posterior concentration ellipse for RUU. So this is prediction error covariance. This is prediction error covariance with no measurement of V. All right, so that looks good. But this, again, is a bulk definition of coherence between two subspaces spanned by random variables. Now, if we want to resolve it into its constituents, then we get 1 minus the product of 1 minus ki squared. And you remember, in the case of Euclidean coherence, these were principal angles between subspaces. Now there's something else. There's still principal angles between this subspace, but they're going to have a different kind of a meaning, which I want to talk about next. So in fact, if we look at this bulk definition of coherence between two subspaces, I'm rewriting the formula I had. We can write it as 1 minus a determinant here, 1 minus this product of ki squares. And in fact, these ki's are singular values of a coherence matrix. And this coherence matrix is ruu minus a half, ruv, rvv minus h over 2. Now, this is coherence. Now, it's a coherence matrix. Just think about taking ruv, which is a complex coherence, divided by RUU minus a half, divided by RVV minus a half, and you can see that this really is a coherence matrix. And in fact, these KIs, which are singular values, this coherence matrix, are called canonical correlations between canonical coordinates. And I note that most students know and love principal components, which is a one-channel idea. And if, if you know and love principal components, you should learn to know and love canonical coordinates because this is a two-channel principal component idea. And the important point to be made here is if you want to resolve this bulk coherence into its constituent parts, 
its constituent parts are squared canonical correlations, and these canonical correlations are eigenvalues in a singular value decomposition of a coherence matrix. So again, a coherence matrix shows up when we're trying to talk about coherence between two subspaces now spanned by random variables. All right, now, again, uh, so I, there, there's a picture here. So we started out with two linear spaces spanned by a random vector u and a random vector v, and these, these two linear spaces had some angle between them. But in order to resolve that angle between them, what we had to do was whiten the first channel, whiten the second channel, and then do a simultaneous rotation of these two whitened vectors. So this is a white vector here, this is a white vector here, this is an orthogonal transformation, that's an orthogonal transformation. These are canonical coordinates, and it's the correlation between these, these canonical correlations, which resolve this bulk coherence between these two subspaces. So in, that, in the Hilbert space picture, these canonical coordinates are essential to our understanding. In fact, they'll show up when I work a problem later on in the talk. All right. Now, in the special case where this U is a one-dimensional subspace spanned by a single random variable U, then the Hilbert coherence, if you just work through the details, is RUV, RVV inverse, RVU over RUU. And that in the statistics literature is called multiple correlation. And now the picture is, is that we've resolved the variance of u, of this random variable u, we've resolved it into two orthogonal components. One is the prediction error covariance, the other one is multiple, multiple correlation. And again, if you sort of chase down everything in here, uh, the, so I, I say that this term here is relative prediction error variance this thing is multiple correlation, and when p equals one, in other words, when both subspaces are one-dimensional, then this is ordinary correlation as defined in a Hilbert space. Okay, good. All right, now that's all, that's all tutorial, and now what I'm going to do is try and show how, as we go through various generations of st statistical signal processing, we encounter these Euclidean and Hilbert st space notions of uh, coherence. So I, I'm going to talk about the Cromer Rao bound. Now, how can I call the Cromer Rao bound a generation one idea when Joseph Tabrikian gave us this mind bending talk on performance bounds? Well, my defense is I'm going to talk about a very, very elementary problem in performance bounding, very elementary. And it goes like this I'm going to make a noisy measurement. So this y uh, is an n vector. I'm making a noisy measurement of a signal and some unknown parameters theta modulate the signal. In other words, we say they modulate the mean value vector in a normal distribution. So I'll take this to be normal and the mean value now is going to be modulated by parameters. Now if you look at the Fisher matrix for this problem for estimating theta from y, it's a Gramian. And this Gramian is simply a Gramian of sensitivity matrices. So this G is an N by P matrix. Its columns are sensitivity matrices, sensitivity vectors. And the ith sensitivity vector is simply the partial of X with respect to theta I. So GI tells you what happens to X, how much X wiggles when you wiggle theta just a little bit. Wiggle theta, wiggle X, and this is how much this is how much you wiggle it by is partial x with respect to theta i. Now, if we isolate the parameter theta i and its sensitivity vector g i and call all the other sensitivity vectors columns of g i, then we can look at the i ith element of j inverse to get the Cromer Rao bound on the mean squared error for any unbiased estimator of theta i. But now let's normalize this by the Cromer Rao bound in the case where all parameters but theta i are known. In other words, what happens if we've just got a single parameter modulating the mean value vector of this multivariate normal? Well, if we normalize this thing, 
we simply get 1 over 1 minus cosine squared gi, gi. So now we've got this Euclidean coherence between two subspaces, one spanned by this sensitivity vector gi, the other being a multidimensional subspace spanned by all the other gi's. And I note here that this cosine squared is just a Euclidean cosine squared we first encountered. It's the cosine squared between the one-dimensional subspace little gi and the multidimensional subspace big gi, Euclidean coherence. And there's a simple picture here which says that for your problem, if you define this one-dimensional subspace spanned by the sensitivity vector for the ith parameter, and you call this the linear space spanned by all other sensitivity vectors, then to have a good problem, this gi has to lie well outside this linear space. If it lies close to this linear space, you can see that this normalized mean squared error is a large number. And it makes a lot of sense. In other words, if you set up a measurement scheme so that your sensitivity to variation in theta i can be well modeled by a linear combination of sensitivities to wiggling all the other parameters, you are sunk. So to have a good problem, the sensitivity to wiggling the parameter of interest cannot look like a linear combination of sensitivities you could have got by wiggling all the other parameters. And any self-respecting scientist knows this. I mean, you, this is the kind of picture you would build in your mind without knowing any statistical inference. Okay, so that's my first problem. Now, compression is in the air. Suppose, suppose we take this noisy measurement of this modulated mean value and we compress it. So the idea behind compression is to replace this n-dimensional me noisy measurement by an m-dimensional measurement where m is smaller and in some cases much smaller than n. That's the compression idea. So phi is a short, fat matrix. So what happens to the picture now? Well, not much happens except in that previous picture when I had a Fisher matrix which was a Gramian. It's now a Gramian in projections of the columns of G onto the space spanned by the columns of phi transpose or the rows of phi. So we completely modify the sensitivity matrix. Again, I'll repeat myself by saying we project these sensitivities onto the row space of phi. That's all that happens. So the geometrical picture does not change. Okay, so perhaps we'll choose this compression matrix consist of independent normal 1 over m random variables, Gaussian random variables. Our formulas do not change, except we've got these projections here. So our geometrical picture doesn't change, but of course the sensitivity vectors have changed and performance is impacted. Now to demonstrate that, what we've done is cooked up a problem here where we have a 64 element array or it could be a 64 sample time series. In the ray processing literature, we will have a propagating plane wave from boresight at ang electrical angle zero, but then we're going to have an interfering signal arriving from off boresight. And the problem is to estimate the angle of the boresight signal, which we don't know, when there's an interfering signal coming off boresight. And with no compression, then the CR bound looks like this. And you can see as the interfering signal gets close to the boresight signal, why the angle between these two subspaces gets very close, and the Cremere Rob bound, in fact, becomes unbounded. But now what happens if we randomly draw these Gaussian compression matrices and we run this experiment with the compression by a factor of two, and you can see that we get somewhere between oh, 3 and 5 dB of loss dependent upon what kind of a draw we get. So the point here is that if you look at compression problems when you're compressing noisy data, there are real consequences, there are real performance consequences, and you cannot consider compression unless you have uh, 
an overabundance of signal to noise ratio. So if you have an overabundance signal to noise ratio, go ahead and think about compression. You can tolerate the performance hit that you get, but if you don't have an overabundance of signal to noise ratio, as in most radar and sonar problems, then you have to think very carefully about compression. All right, now, now I want to talk about a generation two problem matched in adaptive subspace detectors. And the problem here is that we, we're trying to detect a signal HX. Now, this H is an N by P matrix, and you can think about the columns of H as modes of the signal. So we know this signal is composed of a linear combination of modes, but we don't know what kind of constructive or destructive interference we have between these modes. That's determined by the the complex mode weights x. So you choose some complex mode weights x, you get a linear combination of the columns of H. All you know is this signal, if it's there, lies in the subspace spanned by the columns of H. All right, now, the problem is we'd like to decide whether what we've observed is noise with covariance matrix sigma squared R or whether it's noise with covariance sigma squared r with a linear combination of these modes. And as I say, we don't know what the linear combination is. So we, we don't know what x is, and we don't know what the noise power is. Now, if you work through this problem looking for the uniformly most powerful invariant test, you're led to this ratio of quadratic forms. And this is basically a quadratic form in a projection matrix divided by the norm of your measurement. Now, there's a little detail here. This G is a whitened version of H. Z is a whitened version of Y. But that is the uniformly most powerful invariant detector, and it, we actually know its distribution under the null hypothesis. It's a beta 2P, 2N minus P, which means that we can set thresholds for false alarm control. And actually, this generalizes to the so-called ACE statistic, when R is also unknown, but you're able to estimate R from an ancillary experiment, and to make a long story short, you just replace this whitening matrix by a sample covariance matrix, and there are optimality properties for this as well. There's a picture. So basically, you measure Z. There's a linear space, G, p-dimensional linear space and you measure the cosine squared of the angle between the measurement and the linear space. You don't measure the distance. So evidently, these cones matter. Now, these cones are invariance sets. In other words, if I take Z and I rotate it in the plane of Z, I don't change the angle. I don't change the value of the test statistic. So it's invariant to rotations in this subspace. It's invariant to rotations in the perp space. It's invariant to scale. So if I scale z, I can scale z way up here, I still have not changed the cosine squared of the angle between the measurement and linear subspace. And the important thing is here that you don't measure distance between the measurement and the subspace. You measure the cosine squared of the angle. And the reason is you don't know sigma squared here so you don't know what to expect out of the two norm squared of z. All right, so here's an idea where Euclidean cosine squared of the angle is actually the, the optimum detector. And again, we know the null distribution. So here's the null distribution where the dimension of the subspace is four and you have a 64 element measurement. If you have a worse problem where your dimension of your subspace is eight, and you have a 32-dimensional measurement, that's worse. So you always want low-dimensional subspaces in high-dimensional measurement spaces, but you can't always have that. In fact, if the dimension of your signal space is one, then you get an incoherent matched filter, but more generally, you get one of these incoherent matched subspace detectors. Okay, now I want to do another generation two problem here. And this is called multi-stage or greedy filtering. I call this a generation two problem. And this started actually with, with uh, Scott Goldstein and Irving Reed. And it came up after I had visited USC and given a talk on canonical coordinates. And I got this excited message from Scott Goldstein 
a few weeks later saying, uh, Louis, I found a great application for canonical coordinates, and he sent me this manuscript, and I read it, and I said, Scott, uh, this is really interesting, but it's not canonical coordinates, it's something else. And here's what it was. In this problem, x you can think of x as a complex symbol, or you can think of it as an amplitude of a propagating plane wave, or you can think about it as an amplitude of some uh, mode in a spectral decomposition, and now you have a multidimensional measurement which is correlated with x. And the idea is that instead of doing a matrix-valued map of y to estimate x, you're actually going to resolve y into scalar internal variables. So you're going to take the inner product between y and this direction vector to get u1. And then you're going to take an inner product with d2 to get u2. And you're going to keep on going, whittling this y, well, you whittle it down to a one-dimensional problem, then two, three, and so forth, and you keep on going. But you'd like to do it in such a way that all these variables you've produced are uncorrelated so that you can easily estimate x from a linear combination of these things. And you want this greedy algorithm to keep generating new, new decays, new good decays. And you want a way of figuring out when you can stop. Now, it turns out that in a lot of problems, you can stop very, very early. So if you have a problem where the covariance matrix of y has a few distinct eigenvalues repeated many, many times. So the covariance matrix of Y could be a large matrix. But if it has just a few unique eigenvalues, then this thing terminates in a number of steps equal to the number of distinct eigenvalues. So it's a pretty compelling structure. And the way we do this, it was called multi-stage Wiener filtering. It was subsequently shown that it was equivalent to a conjugate gradient algorithm. So you just run a conjugate gradient algorithm to generate those direction vectors. And as you go through this problem, x is what you're trying to estimate. uk are these internal variables that you have generated. uk plus 1 is the new internal variable that you will generate with the new direction vector. Now, we're interested in the Hadamard coherence for this thing. So we might get the Hadamard coherence after k steps and then get the Hadamard coherence after k plus 1 steps. And there are a few steps of algebra here, but basically the Hadamard coherence through k plus 1 steps is the Hadamard coherence through k steps. And if the Hadamard coherence through k steps is not large enough, in other words, there's not enough coherence between these internally generated variables and what you're trying to estimate, you need to go another step, and this other step is a Euclidean coherence. Well, in fact, you can even show it's a Hadamard coherence. So when we try and update in this algorithm, we're keeping track of coherence to find out whether we need to improve the Hadamard coherence by going one more step, which is like saying we need to improve the coherence between x, which is what we're trying to estimate, and these internally generated random variables, and that is multi-stage filtering. Okay, now how am I doing for time? I have 15 minutes? Is that what you said? Okay, good. All right, so now I want to go to generation three, and I want to work two problems that uh, so, uh, two PhD students of mine have recently cracked. And the first, problem go, the first problem is compression of a noisy sensor measurement for transmission over a noisy channel. And I want to be careful in my definition of what the problem is. So this X is some kind of a multidimensional signal. And it's M-dimensional, and here it is at this node, we don't get to look at it. This m-dimensional signal comes through a linear sensor, h. So what comes out of here is h times x, but it's noisy. So our measurement here is a noisy version of a linearly transformed signal. So we call this a noisy sensor measurement. 
Now, if we stop the problem right here, just right here, and we tried to reduce the dimension of y, in other words, I suppose I were trying to build this w here to reduce the dimension of y to n, from n dimensions to r dimensions. If I stopped the problem right there, it would be what we call reduced rank filtering, and we've known how to solve this problem since uh, about 1990. So that's reduced rank filtering. But now, suppose you're going to compress this thing and send it through a linear channel and also add noise in the linear channel. So now you can see that we're compressing a noisy sensor measurement. That's the noisy sensor measurement. We'll compress it. But now we're going to send it through a channel with noise. All right, so the problem is, is we've got to exact a power constraint, trace W, R, Y, Y, W transpose. Now that's simply the power out of our compressor. And we're constrained the power that we put into this channel to be less than or equal to P. The output of the channel will be DWY plus omega. And our problem purely and simply is to minimize, with respect to W, the determinant of the error covariance matrix of X given Z. So at the end of the day, we've got Z. From this Z, we want a linear estimator of X. The error covariance matrix will be QXX given Z, and we want to minimize the determinant of that, which is minimizing the volume of the concentrational, the a posteriori concentration lips. That's the problem. Okay, now there's a solution to this problem. Oh, I want to make one more comment. If in this problem H is identity, and there is no noise here, so that Y is simply a direct look at the signal, and we try and look for W to send through this linear channel with noise, that's pre-coding and equalizing. So this problem generalizes pre-coding and equalizing. It generalizes reduced rank linear filtering. Now there's a solution, and the solution looks like a product of three matrices. The first one is a whitening filter. We whiten the measurement. The second one is a coordinate transformation into the system of canonical coordinates. And those are the, those are the canonical coordinates we saw early on in the talk. And these canonical coordinates are essentially, they have, these canonical coordinates have correlations which resolve the, co the coherence between the subspace spanned by X and the subspace spanned by our measurement Y. Now this lambda R is a reduced rank diagonal scaling matrix. And it's a function of canonical coordinates, canonical correlations, and noise variances in the channel with the rank determined by the power constraint. And U is a rotation into the subdominant subspace of the channel noise. So what this, what this compressor looks like is whitening, coordinate transformation in the system of canonical coordinates, scaling, rotation. So we call this scaled and rotated canonical coordinates. And that's, and that's the way in which pre-coding and equalizing is generalized. It's the way in which uh, reduced rank filtering is generalized. So it's a general architecture. And, it's, and we can ask now, what's the net effect of compression? So in other words, what's going to happen as we compress with this matrix W? Okay, well, ideally we would have the determinant of QXX given Y. Remember, Y was the measurement we had before we compressed. So that's the best you can do. That's the best volume you can get. And then you multiply by a product of terms from R plus 1 to the minimum of the dimension of the signal and the dimension of the measurement, 1 over 1 minus Ki squared. So if your power constraint is so binding that you have to throw away squared canonical coordinates, which are near to 1, you get a big boost in the volume of your error covariance matrix. That's a bad thing. This next term is noise effects of the channel, and it's too complicated to read, but basically, this product is from 1 to R, and R is the number of, of sub-channels of the channel that you use to transmit this compressed signal over. All right, so you can see that this is the idealized case with no compression, no channel. This is the boost due to compression, 
this is the boost due to transmitting these scaled canonical coordinates over a noisy channel. And there's a solid mercury water filling interpretation. And this is the first good, this is the first good subchannel of the channel that you're going to use. This is the second good channel, third good channel, so forth. These solid levels are nothing but the noise variance in that subchannel divided by the canonical squared canonical correlation in that channel. So that as long as the squared, as long as the noise power is small and the canonical correlation is near to one, that solid level is pretty low. This water level is actually the scaling. That's the amount by which you scale these canonical correlations. And this mercury is the stuff you put in the middle to make the whole thing add up to this constant level. And that mu is a parameter which is determined by the noise power constraint. All right, so that's a pretty complete story which my student uh, Yuan Wang has recently found. Okay, I want to I want to terminate with one other uh, generation three result, and actually this result comes out of a collaboration I had with uh, sem several Spanish colleagues, and then. Uh, uh, a, a further generalization of this result was got by a, another student of mine at Colorado State University. Now, I'm going to try and avoid all this detail here and just explain the problem. The problem is, is that we have sensor 1, sensor 2, sensor 3, L sensors. So these are L time series. So we're going to, we're going to measure a time series out of each of L sensors. And we want to know if there's linear dependence among time series. And this is a problem that was actually first visited by Cochrane, Gish, and uh, Sino in 95, and then studied by uh, Amir Lesham and Van der Veen in 2001. They didn't do this problem quite as generally as we're going to do it, but they were motivated by the same kind of a problem where you had measurements at L sensors and you were looking for linear dependence between the outputs of those L sensors, we generalized it to L sensors worth of time series. Now the game here is going to be, be to take this time series and under it stack this time series and under it tack, stack this time series. So we're going to get a large space time vector consisting of time series over time series over time series over time series. So this R matrix is going to be the covariance matrix of this space-time vector. And we're going to just define Hadamard coherence to be 1 minus the determinant of this large space-time matrix divided by the product of these determinants. Well, it turns out that if those time series are wide sense stationary, and if the length of the time series grows without bound, then this Hadamard coherence can be written this way. So it's a complicated formula, one minus the exponent, integral minus pi plus pi, log determinant of a cross spectral matrix divided by the product of the diagonal elements of the cross spectral matrix. So, what we have said is this is broadband coherence. So if you look in the literature of radar and sonar, there's a pretty well understood idea of what narrowband coherence is. But this is broadband coherence. And it amounts to computing the determinant of the, of the cross-spectral matrix divided by its diagonal elements and then taking the log, in other words, measuring in dB, and integrating over the Nyquist band. All right, so that's what Hadamard coherence says. Now, suppose we don't have R. All we have is measurements. Now we're going to try and test the hypothesis that R is diagonal, block diagonal, versus the hypothesis that it's some other Hermitian matrix. Now, if this R, we're testing the hypothesis that this R is block diagonal, that means there's no linear dependence among the time series. That suggests that we don't know, there's no propagating wave front. There are no correlated effects in the medium. So in, in uh, cognitive radio, that suggests that there's no transmitter transmitting a plane wave signal. 
Well, the remarkable thing is, is that the optimum test statistic is the determinant of S over the product of the determinant of some other determinants. And these are sample covariance matrices. So these are sample covariance matrices computed from the data. And this result that my student at CSU has got is that this statistic is equal in distribution to a double product of beta random variables. And that means that under the null hypothesis, we know the distribution, at least we have a stochastic representation of the distribution, we can set thresholds to control false alarm probability. Okay, now I think I'm running, I'll, I'll skip a few, I'll skip a slide here. I'm not even going to do that one. I'm gonna stop here. And, and I'm gonna conclude in the following way by saying there seem to be many topics in statistical signal processing where coherence reveals an orderly or logical relation of parts. In other words, coherence might be called an organizing principle that helps us understand the kinds of things we've derived over three generations of statistical signal processing. In some cases, coherence is a design parameter to be managed, as in these compression problems I worked, as in the greedy multi-stage problems, we were managing coherence. In other words, we didn't stop until we had enough coherence. So in that, those cases, it's a design parameter to be managed. In other cases, it's a statistic to be estimated from the data. So if we look at the matched subspace detectors, we're actually computing a statistic, which turns out to be a coherence statistic. And in that last example I worked where we were solving the space-time problem, looking for linear dependence among time series from sensors. Again, coherence was the st statistic that we computed from the data. And in all these cases I mentioned, the null distribution is governed by a beta law. And that means under the null distribution, we know what the distribution is. Under the null hypothesis, we know what the distribution is. We can set thresholds, control false alarm probabilities. Okay, thank you very much.